Okay, Daniel. I welcome you for our first webinar for this year entitled ESG for SMEs. In today's rapidly evolving business landscape, the principles of environmental, social, and governance criteria ESG have transcended from being mere buzzwords to becoming essential pillars for sustainable and responsible business conduct. It is imperative for small and medium enterprises, which are the target audience for today's webinar, to embrace these principles not only as a means of ensuring long-term viability, but also as a reflection of their commitment to ethical practices and social well-being. However, where are we now? The Gozo Business Chamber conducts a biannual business sentiment survey. During the one conducted in September 2023, 45% of those interviewed highlighted that their business will be impacted by climate change. And we all know that this is an important pillar of ESG. However, we know that ESG goes far beyond climate change. And 45% of those interviewed highlighted as well that they are not aware of the ESG criteria and how these will impact their business. So following last year's webinar, we decided to continue this year to delve further into the topic. At the Gozo Business Chamber, we firmly believe that sustainable business practices are not just a moral imperative, something we have to do, but also as a strategic necessity for SMEs to strive for growth and resilience in an increasingly competitive marketplace. And through this webinar, we aim to equip SMEs with the knowledge, tools, and insights necessary to integrate ESG considerations into their business operations seamlessly. Our webinar today will delve into the fundamental aspects of ESG. Participants can expect to gain valuable insights that will empower them to drive positive change within their organizations. This is a testimony to our unwavering commitment to foster a culture of sustainability and responsible business conduct within our local business community. By providing SMEs with the necessary guidance and resources, we strive to catalyze a collective effort towards building a more sustainable and prosperous future for all. We have an important array of speakers today. To this, to this end, special thanks goes to Dr. Roberta Lepre from Weave Consulting, with whom we are collaborating as a chamber on the aspect of ESG, and also uh, Clint Flores, head of the ESG department within Bank of Atlanta. I would now like to thank them in advance for their contribution. Thank you for your participation, and we look forward for your active engagement in this pivotal conversation. All of those who are participating on our online platform, please feel free to post your comments and questions, which will be answered by our panelists during the dedicated question and answer session. But before starting, let me invite the president of the Gozo Business Chamber, Michael Gallia, to make his introductory remarks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to welcome you to our online webinar titled ESG for SMEs, organized by the Gozo Business Chamber. As the president of this chamber, I am delighted to see the growing interest and awareness surrounding the pressing need for environmental, social, and governance practices 
in today's business landscape. In recent years, there has been a significant shift in mindset with increasing recognition of the imperative to address environmental concerns and uphold social responsibilities. For climate change to diversity, businesses are now expected to be active participants in shaping a sustainable future, ensuring that our past mistakes do not dictate our future trajectory. Indeed, the challenges posed by climate change are already evident, impacting supply chains, operations, and communities globally, including here in Malta and Gozo. The urgency to address these challenges cannot be overstated, particularly as we strive to navigate towards a net zero carbon future. While our islands face their unique set of challenges in achieving sustainable growth, particularly highlighted in the 2022 country report by the European Commission, it is crucial to recognize the pivotal role that small and medium-sized enterprises play in our local economy. With the majority of businesses being SMEs, their embrace of ESG initiatives is essential for fostering a more sustainable economy. Despite SMEs not being subject to ESG reporting under current accounting rules, there are compelling reasons for them to integrate sustainability into their operations. Adopting sustainable practices not only benefits the environment, but also means significant advantages for SMEs, including cost reductions, access to new markets, and improved competitiveness. In pursuit of sustainability, SMEs can undertake various measures to enhance their ESG performance. From reducing CO2 emissions to investigating, to investing in renewable energy sources and improving energy efficiency, there are numerous opportunities for SMEs to operate in a greener manner while also re reaping financial rewards. Moreover, as the importance of ESG information is an, in assessing credit worthiness grows, SMEs with robust ESG credentials stand to gain access to better financial conditions and critical resources, further underscoring the business case for sustainability. In conclusion, I urge all SMEs to embrace the ESG imperative, not only as a moral obligation, but also as a strategic advantage. By integrating sustainability into their business models, SMEs can contribute to a more resilient and prosperous future for our communities and our planet. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to the insights that our distinguished speakers, Mr. Clint Atzopardi Flores and Dr. Roberta Lepre will share with us today. Let us embark on this journey towards a more sustainable future together. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I now invite uh, Dr. Roberta Lepre to make her presentation. Thank you and good morning. I'm just going to take two seconds to share my screen if you allow me and in the meantime, I really wish to thank the Gozo Business Chamber for organizing this initiative, which shows the growing importance of ESG issues. And I would also like to thank BOV for supporting this initiative. So my name is Roberta Lepre. Um, I am the founder and managing director of Weave Consulting, which is a small firm solely dedicated towards educating the business community primarily on ESG and its benefits, and also assisting um, companies, both large and small, in their journey towards uh, a better impact, so to speak. Um, I'm a lawyer by profession. I have spent 
so to speak, the last 20 years. So that <laughs> gives away my age. Um, working in the social sector, I have worked in the public sector, um, particularly in areas pertaining to equality and human rights. Um, and then I moved on to the nonprofit sector for a number of years, where I felt, I thought at the time, um, I could create better change. Um, however, after a number of years, I came to the realization that really and truly it is business, especially the SMEs that are the engine of society. They are the creative community of our society. They are the ones that make things happen. So I realized that to create positive change, whether of a social or, or of, of an environmental nature, one needs to work with the business community. So it took me quite a while to come to that realization, but I'm happy to say that this is reaping results because the business community has been very much aware and has um, taken on a sense of responsibility in addressing the growing number of social and environmental issues that we are facing. So today um, I'm going to touch upon uh, three main themes. So primarily the role of business in society today. Um, secondly, uh, ESG issues, which, of, which is of course the highlight of our seminar today and how that links to creating a sense of purpose within our businesses and our organizations. And then we'll also be discussing the benefit uh, that businesses that take this purpose-driven approach, uh, they can reap um, also from a purely business point of view. And hopefully that will also open up the discussion as well. So I would like to start off by discussing with you these two theories. So the shareholder and the stakeholder theory. So the shareholder theory um, essentially originated in the early 20th century, but became uh, more well known in the 70s. And uh, it argues that the primary responsibility of a business is to its shareholders. And that is, I would say, the position and the mindset of many until just recently. No? So even if we look at our company law, the aim you know of a business as a vehicle is to create a, re a return for the shareholders you not know, to maximize shareholder wealth um, assuming also that doing so would help to allocate resources across the economy and still benefit society as a whole because one would be also creating jobs and indirectly helping society in that way but the emphasis under the shareholder theory is the importance of profit maximization, obviously within the bounds of the law and within what is considered to be ethical. Um, what is considered to be ethical is part of our custom and custom also changes and evolves over time. Okay, So what is perhaps not so ethical today may have been considered ethical within that context 30 years ago, but this is something that is constantly moving and evolving. And then we started looking at the stakeholder theory. So what is this? So this is a theory that uh, uh, we started discussing and started getting more prominence towards the 80s. And uh, with this theory, the focus is broadened. So we're no longer focusing just on the shareholders, but we're acknowledging that many other stakeholders are actually impacted by the activities of that business. And this includes their employees, it includes our customers, it includes our suppliers, also our community as a whole, and even the overall natural environment now that we're operating it in. And the argument here is that businesses do have an ethical and also a social responsibility, sometimes also a legal responsibility towards all of their stakeholders and not just economic responsibilities to, towards the shareholder. And within this theory, the suggestion is uh, that long-term success and sustainability require actually balancing all these different in interests, no? rather than just prioritizing shareholder profit above everything else. I have highlighted the phrase long-term because um, 
I, I think it's also a matter of mindset, no? So again, traditionally, perhaps we focused more on short-term profitability, but with the stakeholder theory, which also goes into sustainability and virtually ESG, the focus more is more on the medium to long-term stability, sustainability, and success. Which brings me now to the business case for purpose. So um, over the years, we have uh, uh, come across and there have been a number of studies which are showing us uh, what we call the business case for purpose. So the fact that companies that are purpose driven, that are actually mindful and take on the responsibility for the stakeholder impact, those are able to achieve higher levels of innovation and employee satisfaction, which in turn leads to more profitability and even more growth, okay? And this study emphasizes that a clear purpose can actually help companies navigate a very rapidly changing business environment in a more effective way. So it's not just this study, there have been a number of studies over the years. Um, I have listed some of them here, but essentially they are showing us, you know, the message is one, that those companies that have a clearly defined purpose, that they act in terms of um, oper uh, putting that purpose within their operations and manage to create a culture where um, purpose is clearly defined and everyone is engaged, those companies do better in the long term. So they are also more profitable and also more, more successful. Which brings me now to the notion of ESG. No? So uh, today we are discussing ESG. So how is ESG linked to purpose? Okay. So first of all, I think we need to have a little bit of clarity on what we mean by ESG because we've heard a lot about the term lately, especially this last year. Um, there, uh, the, in the introduction, we heard as well uh, about some aspects of ESG, but it's, I think, important to, to remember what we're talking about. So E, okay, there are different criteria which fall under the environmental Pillar. So primarily, we're talking here about tackling pollution, both of our air and also our water. Um, also issues such as noise pollution, you know, they are also very much related also to the S part, so the, the well-being um, of the community. So we'll also see as we go along that the three different pillars are also interconnected and intertwined. We're looking at our natural resources, making sure that we don't deplete our natural resources, the impact of our operations on our biodiversity, issues of deforestation, which might be, of course, more um, of an issue in some, in some uh, locations than others, Conser conserving our energy and also maybe shifting to cleaner sources of energy, managing our waste, um, addressing issues of water scarcity and also um, issues related to the treatment of animals and animal care. In terms of the S part, um, we are looking at the impact of our activities on our people, okay? So who are our people? First of all, internally, okay? The people who work for the organization, our employees. Um, uh, in one of the introductory Speeches, for instance, we heard about the diversity. What are we doing in terms of promoting and managing diversity effectively within our workforce? Are we making sure that we're safeguarding the health and safety of our employees? We've heard a lot lately about health and safety. It's very important that we make sure that we are aligned with the requirements related to health and safety. Are we giving our employees all the benefits that they are entitled to? Are we make sure, making sure that there is adequate um, uh, conditions at work, work-life balance? Are we also making sure that there is access to career development and personal development within the place of work? So these are the kind of issues that we touch upon when we discuss the S part of ESG, and that relates primarily to our employees. But then when it comes to people, there is also the aspect of our customers, okay? So the impact that we are having on our customers also through the provision of the products or services that we provide, okay? Are we offering safe products to our consumers? And then also 
the impact that we are having on the broader community. So what are we doing as a company to help in terms of community de development? How are we interacting with our community and how are we ensuring that we contribute towards positive community development? So that is more or less the S part of ESG. And then we come to governance. Governance is maybe uh, the least exciting or interesting part um, I think it tends to be often overlooked. Um, we tend to think of governance as something that the government on the, or the public administration has to do. But even we as a company, if, even if we are a smaller company, okay, we need to make sure that we implement principles of good governance because this is what ultimately ties everything together. Okay, So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the leadership of our company, we're talking about how our organization is structured, how we manage delegation and accountability. We're talking about executive remuneration. We're talking about how our boards are composed, including elements of diversity, even at the board level. We're talking about doing business fairly, okay? Ethical business practices, competing fairly within the market, um, engaging with different stakeholders in a clear and transparent way and also making sure that we also contribute fairly by paying our taxes on time and also making sure that we have um, policies and structures in place to identify any wrongdoing and also to report and address any potential wrongdoings. So this is, in a nutshell, the governance side of ESG. Again, how is all this linked to purpose? So we know that these two elements are di di directly linked, very closely linked, because both ESG and purpose, they are about creating sustainable, ethical, and responsible business practices you now at the end of the day. So ESG, on the one hand, it provides a framework for us to be able to evaluate the specific impact of the company in the different areas, the environmental, the social, and the governance. When Corporate's purpose, on the other hand, it actually relates to the company's actual core values, you know, the very reason why it's doing what it's doing, okay, it's there to operate and to make a profit, but what is it that it's contributing towards and achieving um, at the end of the day, besides making money? So it's an approach which helps us manage risk um, address, identify risks and managing them, and also in turn uh, see these uh, certain opportunities that may, may arise when we go through this thinking process. And also at the end of the day, contributing to a positive social impact and creating value. It's all about creating value, okay? In the long term, again, this we have to move away from this mindset of the short term and look at our impact in the longer term. We need to think about tomorrow. So those of you who are familiar with the concept of sustainability, it's about being mindful of our actions um, and the impact that our actions are having on future generations, okay? So thinking long term. So in essence, ESG is a pathway for businesses to put purpose into their operations, okay? So the, the purpose is the values, the, the broader values, whereas ESG are the specific criteria through which those values are going to be expressed. And like that, we ensure that our values, our purpose, our core reason for being is reflected in our day-to-day -day activities and in our long-term strategy. When it comes to environment, the connection to purpose, it can include commitments to sustainability, to conservation, to positive environmental impact. We can choose to set certain goals, which can be ambitious, okay? If we think that we can contribute to those ambitious goals and we can align our operations to broader societal values. So we have certain values, we have certain goals as a society, even as a global community, okay? So for instance, there are the sustainable development goals. What are we as a company doing to contribute towards the sustainable development goal? 
there is the European Green Deal, okay? We have targets towards decarbonization. What are we as a company doing to contribute towards the achievement of those targets, such as, as mentioned here, combating climate change, climate change and preserving natural resources. So we are part of a broader ecosystem, okay? What are we as a company doing to be part of that broader ecosystem? Again, the social aspect is the relationship with our stakeholders, with our employees, with our suppliers. Let's not forget our suppliers. They are also part of our extended community of our stakeholder network. So a purpose-driven approach to social issues, it can involve improving work practices, um, improving our engagement with the community, investing in the community to develop that community and ensuring, for example, product safety. And companies that have this strong sense of purpose, they seek to make a positive impact on society whilst building trust. And this is so important. So in business, as you know, it's all about relationships and you cannot have positive relationships if you don't have trust. So when you invest in your people, investing in the community, that helps to build trust and then in turn, it gives you the loyalty of your stakeholders, which can have a huge impact in the success or otherwise of your business. And then governance, the purpose connection um, when it comes to the governance dimension. So as we said, governance is our internal system of our practices, our controls, our checks and balances, our pro procedures that we choose to adopt very often voluntarily. Very often, we don't have to um, implement these actions because we have to abide by the law, unless you're a listed company or a regulated entity, but you choose to do so voluntarily because you value uh, the, the, the benefits of that approach. So it helps us make effective decisions. It helps us comply with the law. Okay, This should be taken for granted that everyone complies with the law, but we also know that very often that's not the case. And in turn, it helps us understand what our stakeholders need and it helps us to meet those needs okay so the, at clear purpose it can include ethical leadership accountability which in turn guide our practices our governance practices and ensuring that there is alignment you know between the values of the company and the long-term success of that same company which brings me now to the benefits, because most of you present here today, you are businesses. Um, we mentioned earlier that profitability is not the only motive of a business, but we, it's not to say that it's no longer important. So a business needs to also be financially sustainable, okay? And there is this um, fear, so to speak, that by becoming more sustainable, by becoming more ESG aligned, to use the terminology that I hear often, um, it's going to be very costly for a company and companies are worried that they will lose their competitiveness because I do understand that there are different costs uh, that a company is facing and it's not easy. Okay, so I wanted to address this. So various studies, including some of those that I have shared earlier, they are showing us that, yes, there is very often an initial investment when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to purpose and ESG. But in the long term, this is an investment that is going to help us reduce our cost. OK, and I'm going to, to give two practical examples. So when it comes to shifting, for example, to solar energy, Okay, so there is an initial capital investment, obviously. So yes, there is a cost to the company, but when one then measures the savings that can be made, okay, and let's not forget we have subsidized bills. So if we didn't have subsidized bills, which is something that we have to start thinking about, okay, um, that return on investment would be even higher. So in the long term, yes, you're making an investment, but that investment is going to result in cost savings. Another cost reduction um, aspect that I want to share and that is maybe not um, so obvious and not so often quantified is that relating to employee turnover. So we know um, how difficult it has become to recruit people 
to uh, retain people more than anything, okay? Um, but we know that companies that are purpose-driven, and I'll come to it even in, in a later slide, we know that those companies manage to increase substantially their, uh, reduce, sorry, their employee turnover rates, okay? So they increase their retention rates. Now, when you lose employees and you have to re-employ, it is very costly, okay? And it can be quantified as well. It is very costly to advertise, to go through the recruitment process, to train an employee, and until that employee starts delivering at the level of the employee that you are replacing, okay? So by investing in a purpose-driven approach, in a purpose-driven culture, you're going to reduce your employee turnover rates and in turn, also reduce your costs. So those are just two examples. And there are others that we can perhaps discuss later on. ESG, a purpose-driven mindset, can also help us increase sales, OK? We know that there is a growing body of consumers that care more and more about these issues, whether it's environmental issues, about social issues. Um, about a year or so ago, um, I uh, uh, conducted a survey together with a firm called Esprimi locally, and we're seeing that this mindset is also coming um, even in Malta. So it's not just something that's happening abroad, but even locally, okay? What we have seen, for instance, is that the younger generation, perhaps they're more um, concerned about environmental issues, but the older generation is perhaps more concerned about the social issues, okay? So by aligning the values of your brand, the values of your product or your service with the values of your stakeholders, you are more likely to attract and retain those customers. And then you might have better access to other opportunities. For example, we're seeing in public tenders we're seeing more and more the integration of these kind of criteria in the award of the of various standards. Okay, so very often you have to show your, for example, the conditions that you're offering to your employees. You have to disclose your environmental practices, and we are anticipating that this approach is going to continue growing as we go along. A very um, understated benefit of ESG and for me potentially the most important is how it can bring about innovation. Okay, so when we're faced with a challenge, we know that we have to stop doing something in a certain way or selling a product in a certain way or building a product in a certain way. Okay, we have to stop and think. We have to come up with something new. And very often that challenge leads to something new, something completely different and something better. Okay, so ESG can really drive innovation. As mentioned earlier, linking it also to cost reduction, it can help us attract talent and retain our talent. It can help us also identify and mitigate certain risks. So I'm not going to go into this very much because I know that Clint will be delving into this aspect into much more depth, but um, mitigating risk, okay, when we are not well prepared for risk and we are we do not manage risk that can also come at a great cost to our business so esg helps us think ahead helps us identify risks and helps us uh, helps us address those risks as we uh, as we come across them and it helps us also to um attract investors to our business we know that Again, um, many investors are looking at these different criteria and they're giving them equal importance as they are to financial criteria. So this is um, more or less a summary of the benefits of ESG. Um, there are various other studies. We know pur purpose-driven companies outperform other companies that are not driven by that sense of purpose up to even 10 times as much. 90% of executives in another study, they say that a commitment to purpose-driven leadership produces long-term financial benefits. Okay, again, long-term. 
employees with a strong sense of purpose, they're at least four times more likely to be engaged in their jobs as other employees, and 84% of executives believe their business transformation efforts will have greater success if integrated with purpose. And the consumer aspect, okay? Um, top issues that consumers identify while making decisions about brands, 28%, according to the study, uh, they value how the company treats its own people and its own employees. 20% of people surveyed in the study, they cared more about how the company treats the environment and another 19%, uh, they looked at how the company supports the community in which it operates. How do it, we integrate ESG with purpose within our organization? So first of all, it's a matter of strategic alignment, okay? So as a company, we can integrate ESG into our business model by aligning our strategic goals as a company with our purpose. We need to engage our stakeholders. We need to talk to our stakeholders. We need to understand their values and their concerns and this will in turn help us define and refine our own purpose as a company and make sure that whatever we're doing in terms of ESG is focused on those areas that will have an impact that are important to our stakeholders. We need to be transparent and accountable and we can do this through ESG reporting. This is a practice that is gaining ground. Okay, so by transparently reporting on our ESG performance, we can reinforce our commitment to our purpose. So this is our commitment and we're publicly making ourselves accountable to our stakeholders through our report. And this includes disclosing our successes when it comes to ESG, but also identifying and communicating to our stakeholders those areas where we need and want to improve, okay? If we only talk of our successes and not of our um, gaps, we're not credible, so we cannot build trust. So we have to be honest and credible with our stakeholders. And innovation and sustainability. So companies that use their purpose as a driver for innovation, it helps them develop new products, new services, and even new processes, okay? Innovation doesn't have to be a new product. It doesn't have to be technology. It should be coming up with a new process, a different way of doing things. So this helps us not only to mitigate risks, but it can help us also open up to new markets and new opportunities. And we know that the sustainability market is growing and it's growing rapidly and it's huge. So what do we do to integrate business in our, to integrate purpose in our business model? We define our purpose. We identify our why, why we're doing what we're doing as a company. And we make sure that that why, that purpose is aligned with our core values. We involve stakeholders in the process. This is not something that the owner or the CEO can do on his own or her own. We need to work together as a team. We engage our team and we also listen to our stakeholders, including our customers. What do our customers need? What do our customers want? And then we embed that sense of purpose into our operations. We align our product and our service offering with that purpose, with those values, and we implement sustainable and ethical practices that are also reflect our values. We communicate our purpose, okay? There are many great companies, uh, many SMEs doing fantastic work, they don't tell anyone about it or the way they communicate, they don't do it effectively. It's important that we tell our story. Let's go out there, we communicate our purpose and this has to be consistent in our communication and our marketing channels. Let your customers know why you're doing what you're doing and how they in turn can contribu contribute to these um, um, overall goals and purposes by choosing you as a business or as a brand and be transparent, okay? It's important to be credible. We have to be transparent. We have to be open about our successes and also our challenges. I mentioned earlier the importance of building trust. Measure your progress and report your impact. Set goals, measure them, track your progress and report and always improve on your performance in relation to those goals. 
post-therapy purpose-driven culture, and this is done by leading by example, okay? So you don't expect your team to do things, but if you're not doing them yourself. So we have to lead by example, but also encourage participation. We create opportunities for our employees, for our team mem members to contribute to the purpose, such as, for example, offering them opportunities for volunteering, community engagement, or other innovation programs. And then we always adapt and improve on what we are doing. We seek feedback from our stakeholders and we have to be willing to pivot, okay? So our original vision might change a little bit and might evolve. We might talk to our stakeholders, maybe the needs are changing and we have to be happy to, to change, to, to pivot as we go along. So I hope I didn't um, take up too much time. That brings me to the end of this part of my presentation, but I look forward to answering any questions and having a bit of a discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Um, thank you very much for your very insight for insights. We will be tackling the questions at the end of the session, but you gave us some very good insights and thoughts I think we, we need to think deeply about. So I now invite uh, Clint Flores to deliver his presentation on ESG sustainability and banking. So up to you, Clint. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, Roberta. Good morning, everyone. Lovely seeing you all. Let me see if I can share my, my screen. Can you... Can you see? Yes, Clint. Uh, All right, but we have to go to the first slide. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, and you thank make you. Make it in presentation mode, Clint, if you would like to. Uh, sorry, see if you can, if it's better. Yes, yes, it's better, thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, this invitation, Daniel, and thank you, everyone. As Roberta was saying, indeed, we will be expanding a little bit on the sustainability of banking and mitigating climate and environmental risks. To put you a little bit into uh, the picture as well, right now we are faced with a lot of regulatory pressure from the regulators, from the uh, from JST. So technically, we have a little bit of a problem in the sense that we have to keep on insisting with the regulators that uh, we need to start at least seeing whether this is going to be a potential uh, problem in terms of even reputational risk on how to implement these things. But so far, banks, they managed to implement them. Technically, um, we have the Climate Paris Agreement, as you could see, um, there was uh, also the initial uh, implementation of the Climate Paris Agreement, and that all came from it. So technically, uh, we have the implementation to start aligning the portfolio with the 1.5 degree Climate Paris Agreement. And also here, we are seeing that most of those uh, regulations are being um, implemented. On the other hand, when it comes to banking, in the past, we used to see these kind of risks, like the major risks were credit risk, market risk, operational risk, and other significant risks, liquidity risks, business risks, and reputational risks. Uh, unrelated uh, risks, we had also systematic risk and moral hazard, but you might ask why I am also uh, mentioning this, reason being that in the past, when we used to browse the internet, we used to see just these kind uh, of risks. You all remember perhaps Yahoo Finance. It was quite current in the past. But today, the difference is that we are seeing other emerging risks, including ESG risks, as was also mentioned by uh, Roberta. So technically, why is it a must to manage uh, such uh, risks? So these are new risks, contemporary emerging uh, risks, which everyone today is acknowledging due to stakeholders' engagement in the sense that 
we are currently seeing a lot of information flowing in, but sometimes it's very technical that we don't get an idea of what is actually sometimes happening at the technical level. From the political level, we have a situation where we have um, a situation where we can see the things that we can see uh, in terms of such as how to implement them. So technically, we need to move to a net zero commitment. And the net zero commitment, the, the, the net zero commitment is to go into, for instance, uh, cutting greenhouse gas emissions, including the putting uh, in place science-based targets and measuring the carbon uh, footprint, foot, uh, footprint, sorry. Knowing our carbon footprint is the first step to reduce it. We are measuring our footprint with these uh, three parameters, which are direct emissions, indirect emissions, and what we are actually financing in terms of indirect emissions as scope three emissions, what would they be? Uh, such emissions would include uh, gases related from employee transport, supply chain activities, and all of the elements that are not uh, within our own control. And banks are financing these things. The pressure being put on banks is to actually understand what we are financing, because we need to understand uh, what uh, we are financing in terms of clients, because what we are financing is actually uh, affecting uh, um, the environment. And technically, the regulators are putting a lot of pressure, especially on regulated banks. And even if they are not regulated banks, even on banks that uh, technically um, uh, are not regulated, but they would need to disclose elements which are not related to uh, the regulatory part from the supervision of the ECB. But then we have um, a situation to see how we're going to mitigate and uh, adaptation of climate change. So uh, we do uh, climate mitigation is on how to reduce uh, emissions. So how are we are going to mitigate emissions and re reducing emissions will slow the process of climate change. That's uh, scientific. Uh, given and the reason why we need to transit to cleaner practices is to decelerate the process of uh, climate change. On the other hand, climate adaptation, what I say climate mitigation, it means uh, that, for instance, we need to start uh, mitigating uh, climate change by, for instance, um, including even practices like solar panels and all of these elements when we do in our practices. Climate adaptation is to prepare and to adapt to climate change, including uh, water stress, heat stress, and droughts. These are all factors that pose pressure on the environment. And if we don't reduce emissions, the following risks will be um, accelerated. And for Malta, the relevance of uh, these risks, and we see um, <coughs> the elements, uh, what we have here on the relevance of Malta. Um, the risk drivers for Malta, for instance, you could see that we could have, will be hit by more uh, heat waves in, in the future, more droughts and water stress, uh, perhaps floods due to extreme precipitation and severe storms, uh, mean temperature and wind soil uh, erosion. These are all uh, elements with the literature review. When we were started also um, including these elements within uh, the risk uh, factors of the bank, which nowadays are also being uh, included uh, in terms of new literature, which is emerging from uh, the ECB and other um, international organizations. So as I said, these are split, the, the risk drivers, the physical risks between acute and chronic. And what we are doing as a bank is mapping, for instance, our uh, collaterals, where they are uh, situated. For instance, if it's a chronic problem, which will be having a sea level rises, if we have some collateral which might be affected by sea level rises in the long run, um, we're talking about in 20 years, uh, 10 years, we do some simulations with within a time horizon of five years, 10 years, and even uh, 20 and 30 years to see how it will be affected. That would mean that the bank is also affected by climate and environmental risks. So there, there would be a risk and that would be reflected in our also decisions eventually to whether finance a project or not. And as I said, 
the physical ri uh, the risks are split between physical uh, we're, we're talking about acute and chronic the chronic ones is very difficult to do anything about it because if the sea level rises you cannot stop the sea level from rising and also affecting the coastline area of Malta and for instance soil erosion as well and mean temperature if they are going to increase you cannot do anything about it on the other hand the acute one uh, is the one which we might eventually have a little bit of control in terms of mitigation and adaptation. On the other hand, we have a problem, not a problem actually, we have a regulatory pressure on the transition risk. What, what does this mean? Transition risk would relate to the business modus operandi to transit to cleaner energy, for instance, to transit to cleaner practices with new technology. For instance, buildings are being required, requested to have EPC regulations, strong regulations on EPC, which are being also negotiated right now to change the uh, EPC directive, and also what the market sentiment uh, look like, looks like. So this transition risk is quite um, important to uh, outline, reason being that uh, for instance, when it comes to, um, let's say, uh, for instance, let's take an energy company. If an energy company doesn't transit to cleaner energy, renewable energy um, on mainland Europe, for instance, it might be that they will be uh, out of business because the market is uh, liberalized there. On the other hand, if you have, for instance, a manufacturing of um, motor vehicles abroad, if they're not reaching the targets and transiting, they might be out of business eventually because uh, equities, shares will, will not be bought by the public simply because they would say that they will be failing in the future um, as a company. Uh, so these are all the transition risks which are associated with climate and environmental risks. So technically, what are the risks that bankers are looking into? As I said before, the property sector plays an important role, especially on the effects of uh, climate change due to the depletion of nature, sources of risks, which are the physical and acute, as I said, and the transition risks that I just mentioned, and the economic risks associated with the physical and transition risk, which is the micro effects on business and households, example, damage to property and warehouses, and the macro effects uh, on prices, um, as I said, on capital and productivity, which poses also then a financial risk, as I said, uh, which would need you to, to retain some capital ratio to make up for any future financial uh, losses as banks. Um, obviously, this was just mentioned before, a carbon neutral Europe by 2050. The objective is to decarbonize the European continent. Uh, the EU is pushing a lot on this um, sphere, even at the international level, not just as an EU, even at UN level, multilateral system, so the United Nations. And even when we have also like you, you follow the COPs um, every year and all also the international organizations. Um, in terms of physical risks, we have some transition uh, channels, transmission channels, which I said, which would impact also the credit risk, as I was giving the example also on sea level rises, for instance. And it's also affecting our operational risk, which might affect our own, um, uh, for instance, operations and the strategic and liquidity risk, which we need to see whether it will be affected, which everything seems to be in place right now, even as a bank, um, because we have done this uh, for the past two years. On climate and environmental transition risk, I already explained uh, that that might affect the reputation as well. The re there's a reputational risks. And for this reason, um, uh, you might have uh, to reconsider uh, the issue of whether you are going to keep on financing even the from a strategy point of view, strategic risk because of technology policy and regulation and market uh, sentiment as well, which affects uh, the reputation and risk of a company in case we are financing as a company which is not transiting to cleaner uh, practices. When it comes, for instance, to real estate, the physical risk scores, um, uh, they vary in terms of physical assets uh, because uh, we need uh, a diversified also portfolio. But, but as I said, we already we, we look into the physical risks, for instance, where the mortgages are located because we need to see whether they will be affected. And you might ask me, how would you know? We know because we have scientific um, reports from the United Nations, scientific reports 
from the European Environmental Agency and scientific reports uh, from other areas of the EU institutions, which would tell you how it will be affected the country if the sea level rises and we have, we have any also uh, torrential uh, rain, pluvial, and, and because also we have a restriction of the territory, it might be affected even more than mainland uh, Europe. So technically what we have done, uh, we had to score uh, how it will be affected in Malta and we had to score um, using a kind of a um, heat map with one, two, three and four um, number. Um, you could see that, for instance, um, you have very high risk, which is one, two is high risk, three is um, moderate and four is low. So when it comes to wholesale trades and also on accommodation, we had to notch it uh, up by one when we saw even the literature of Moody's because we needed to understand how it surely is going to be affected because the territory is a little bit uh, limited. And warehousing, there is extreme weather events when it comes to warehousing, land use constraints uh, might be even more affected from a physical point of view. This is a this is a kind of a map which would show how it will be, how Malta will be affected in terms of also uh, if the sea level rises in terms of when you're seeing those red, red parts over here. That's Bormara area, St. Paul's Bay. In Roman times, it was a port. It might become a port if the sea level rises to above two meters. Water will go back there, but we're talking about 50 years, 100 years, if we keep on with this rate, not reaching the climate Paris targets. Uh, obviously, it's not for us to worry because we will not be here, but for future generations. So technically, um, I wanted to give you a little bit of visibility how it would look like. So technically, if we have any mortgages here, which I don't see we would have in 100 years, but if we keep on financing them, if, if, the, bank, if the bank will be still um, operating, it would be aff affected uh, by, the collateral would be affected by uh, the sea level rises. Same here on the area of Marsa, which might be affected in some other areas. Then we have here uh, the EPC certificates which are also in terms of climate mitigations are needed when it comes to the banks also it's important there and that is something which mitigates the climate change you have energy and efficient buildings renewable energy insulation double glazing and climate adaptation water catchments and also water reservoirs and secondary water systems which needs to be uh, also included when we do the financing decisions as a bank and today, to convince banks to issue credit, uh, we are being pushed to um, ask for EPC certificates. We need efficient buildings, CO2 emissions, and we also need the elements of the climate mitigation, like solar panels, energy, insulation, double glazing, and uh, all of these elements which are needed. And to conclude, when it comes to adaptation, as I was said, water catchment structures and reservoirs are needed. Um, if we are going to have a water stress problem in the future and the heat stress problem, we would need to have water catchments and structures and reservoirs in place. So banks are partners today with uh, achieving uh, sustainability. So when it comes to support and advice and understanding the industry emissions, Financial assistance is important because it's included in the loan pricing formula as a bank, but also we are giving um, a lot of assistance to clients to transit uh, without even um, trying to engage other external auditors because we believe that we need to be partners with our clients to allow them to transit. So technically, that's my presentation for today. Thank you very much, Clint for your presentation. Uh, we, I can see that the discussion has evolved considerably from last year. Um, and also, thank you very much for the insights. But that shows that, a bank, that the bank factors a lot the ESG criteria. So it's not just a matter of, this is a point that we have made in the past, it's not just a matter of obligation. But it's a matter that since customers are part of the supply chain of the bank, 
and the bank needs to take into consideration these principles, such principles will be factored in. I would now like to open the floor for discussion. I know we are running a, a bit late, but we have already the Q&A session, so we'll open up uh, that session. So please, please feel free to post on, on that Q&A, any questions you have. So, uh, Richard, if you can please um, open up the Q&A session for me. It's open and we already have two questions. Yes, so thank for, you. For Dr. Lepper. Okay. Just a minute. So, um, you mentioned social and ethical considerations. How can a small business actually uh, do this? Um, I think that small businesses are at an advantage when it comes to implementing certain practices because they're smaller, they're more dynamic, they don't have so many departments that need to approve a change. So in a sense, it's easier. So when it comes to the social considerations, I've touched upon some of them. Um, related to, for instance, employees, okay? So if we're looking purely at employment law, for example, and how to embed that into your culture. So we spoke, for instance, one of the criteria would be promoting diversity and uh, prohibiting discrimination at the place of work. So when it comes to making sure that you're aligned with the law, the law does not make a distinction between smaller and larger companies, okay? So it's applicable to everyone. So everyone needs to make sure that there's no discrimination at the place of work. But then if you want to take it further, perhaps as a small company, I'm just giving some practical examples. You might want to develop a policy or create a program. A small company can quite easily do this. So nowadays there are so many resources um, that one can tap into. You might want to, for example, get some training in relation to this topic. And there are even funds that you can use to help you with that process. So that is just one example on how a smaller company can do this quite easily and quickly and also tap into other um, funding resources that are available to be able to implement this. I don't know if this answers your question. Um, when it comes to ethical practices, it's the same, okay? So a smaller company might not have, for example, a large board that needs to be structured, but there are still some practices that can be taken on board. So when we talk about ethical practices, we're saying that, for instance, we'll file our tax returns on time, we'll file our annual reports with the MBR, we pay our fair share of taxation no, and VAT on time. Um, we, If we are supporting, let's say, a political party, it's not a matter of not being able to do that, but being transparent about it, okay? Um, competing fairly with, other, with our competitors. Yes, we compete, but we compete fairly. Um, and that's kind of thing. So really and truly, I don't see any issues or any practices that smaller companies can implement. Actually, I think smaller companies can do it quicker. And in most cases, there will also be funding support that larger companies don't have access to because they're large and they wouldn't be eligible. I hope that answers okay. the question. Yes. Um, I So I think... No, no, it very much because you gave concrete examples of actually how this can be done. Another question we have for you, um, I urge all those participating, if they want to be free to post on our Q&A session. Um, in a highly competitive market, how can you actually build the trust? I really think that um, investing in building relationships based on trust can actually help us stand out you know, in a very highly competitive market. So I touched upon this a little bit in my presentation, but I think it's about communicating. But first of all, communicating in a way that is two-way. Okay, So it's not just us talking to our stakeholders, but also listening to our stakeholders. So let's go out there. It doesn't have to be an expensive marketing campaign. It could literally be a Google survey that you share on your Facebook page. But let's go out there and 
ask people to give us their feedback. Let's listen to them or just really talking to them on a one to one basis while we're working or um, engaging with perhaps community organizations who know the needs of the people in our community or in that specific area. So let's have a two way communication. OK, and then when it's us communicating with our stakeholders, let us be genuine. So I mentioned earlier, let's celebrate our successes because I know that there are many good companies doing excellent things. They're not thinking of them as ESG. Um, maybe they think of them as CSR. They think of them as philanthropy or it's just something they do. Or they, do good, they do good things for their employees or maybe they support an NGO or a club in the community and they don't tell anyone. But let's talk about it so let's communicate our successes but let's also communicate where we feel we can do better let's identify where we feel we can do better and be honest about it so this is how i feel we can be build trust so being honest with ourselves as a company where we're doing well where we need to improve and when we communicate we communicate in that honest way and communicating both our successes and both our er needs to improve in certain areas. So that is how I feel we can build trust. So thank you very much. Clint, just wanted to, there seem to be no further questions, but Clint, I just wanted to, to, to make this point. I mentioned it earlier, and uh, it seems that I confirmed from the presentation I saw, is basically that uh, despite there not being a legal obligation on small and medium enterprises, the ESG practices is something the bank will take into consideration when giving out loans. Am I correct to say that? Lindsay? Yes, 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 yes. We are firstly obliged to assist clients to transit. So technically there are some discounts on Positively, discriminate, positively discriminating in terms that if you have, for instance, a lead or BREAM or a PC certificate, you can benefit according to what you have up to 20% discount in the interest rate in the loan pricing formula. Eventually, it still needs to be out as a product, but this is what uh, we pushed for so that we can at least assist clients um, when it comes to uh, having additional costs uh, to implement such measures to become greener, at least they save a little bit from the interest rate eventually in the long run. So you're not going to see that saving immediately, but in the long run, when you have the loan, when you um, when you total it, in the end, you will benefit uh, from the discount, the interest rate discount. And we're talking about having more energy efficient buildings. And that, that, that doesn't mean just on the E. We're talking even on the S. So if on the S you're doing something very good, but on the E you are not scoring as bad, we equate it, it depends. So it's not just environmental, it's E, S, and G. So technically those are all the elements which will be weighted in the loan pricing formula to assist our clients to transit to cleaner and more just practices actually, because on the social side it's more like human rights and um, employee engagement, um, respect for human rights and uh, giving what's right rightfully to, 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 to workers and basically to mitigate the problem of um, human rights abuses. So if there will be any reputational risk on any companies that will be abusing human rights and workers, they will not get, at least this is the recommendation, they will not get credit, they will not get finance because they will pose their reputational risks on banks to finance them. So, Clint, thank you very much. Roberta, thank you very much. We now come to the end of our webinar. I would like to thank you all for accepting our invitation to join us today. I sincerely hope that this webinar was fruitful, both for those who were following us on, on Zoom, but also those who are following us on our social media platform. Um, I would like to thank once again, Dr. Roberta Lepera, uh, Clint Flores, and also Stephen Abella from, from Bank of Valletta, with whom we work very closely when organizing these type of webinars and events. A special note of thanks goes to our technical assistant, technical uh, coordinator, Richard Greff, 
uh, with whom these webinars would not will not be possible because um, the great help gives us. And for the staff here at the chamber, Joanne Parnis and Jasmine Putijic for their assistance. We hope that this webinar was not fruitful only on a general term for all enterprises that were following us, but especially for businesses in Gozo, where we are seeing Gozo becoming carbon neutral in the coming years, help them move on the transition path. But also another important pillar that the Chamber has been um, emphasizing for these past years is the need to act in an ethical and transparent way. So I would like to invite you to continue following us on our webpage and Facebook page. And thanks once again for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.